This is The Big Jump, a podcast about human reinvention, featuring pro athletes who have leveraged their athletic minds for success beyond sports. I'm your host, David Gardner, a professional basketball player turned CEO of branding firm Color Jar. Most everything these days seems to be getting louder. Everyone's got some megaphone in their hand, promoting themselves. I should know. I lead a branding firm by day and host a podcast by night. So given this, meeting today's guest for the first time was, well, surprising. A Super Bowl winner and a marketing director for an iconic multi-billion dollar brand, the favorite college receiver of a very famous quarterback. I guess I expected to meet the personality of a Smash Williams from Friday Night Lights. But instead, I got this. I never really embraced kind of that star (laughs) mentality or really saw myself as like this superstar. You see, in a world that's getting louder, where so many try to sell the sizzle without the steak or a sports drink without the electrolytes, Martin's the real deal. He's earned his wisdom from both disappointments and triumphs, sometimes all wrapped into one. He's an old soul who won't knock you over with flash but who will inspire you with substance. And as you lean in to listen, you'll learn that there's much more to Martin than his resume and much more to his resume than meets the eye. Martin Nance, thanks so much for being on The Big Jump. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Director of marketing at Gatorade, former NFL player. Uh, Really excited to have you on. And, uh, you know, where I'd like to start our conversation is what's your earliest memory playing sports? Yeah, no, that's a that's a good one. Uh, It stirs up a lot of memories for me. I think the earliest one would be playing T-ball. I probably was four or five years old at the time and had a lot of energy and loved to compete even as a little kid. So my parents tossed me in, I guess, any activity they could find. Were your parents hands-on with you with regards to sports or what was that dynamic like between you and your parents? I would say they were hands-on and from the point of view that they would definitely get me signed up for things, make sure I had opportunities to play sports, but um, neither one of them really pushed me in a way that I felt was ever uncomfortable or, you know, I, I think I was always the driver of wanting to be involved in sports. They're trying to keep up with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they they were great. Uh, my, my parents are awesome, but they um, were very supportive, always had my back. But again, it was it was always, I, I think, a pretty healthy balance between me wanting to do it and them uh, them supporting me in that. You grew up uh, in the St. Louis area? Yeah, that's right. Right outside of the city of St. Louis in a suburb, Maryland Heights. A lot of good friends and family back there. How many sports did you play once you got into high school? In high school, I played a, a variety of sports. I played football and kind of starting out and I tried out for the basketball team. Uh, I played baseball. I ran track eventually later on in high school. So yeah, those were the sports. It's really interesting. More and more you see the pressure for athletes, especially when they show some signs of, you know, potential of, um, you know, being able to go on to the next level or even excel at the high school level towards specialization. Yeah. What do you think of that dynamic and how are you able to not adhere to it? You know, times have changed. I I was a believer that, you know, you really pick up great skills and develop different muscles and different mentalities from different sports. So, um, you know, the more you can do, the more you can play, the better. I think developing those skills was really helpful for me. Second to football, track was your your best sport. What did you learn in track that you were able to bring back to football? The first was I just learned how to run, you know, the, the right technique, the right mentality that you need to kind of push yourself to constantly get faster and compete against other people from kind of a just a pure sprinting standpoint. And then the second thing I would say that I developed was a work ethic. It taught you how to work and sacrifice and take care of your body in a way that I think other sports don't always teach. So you're six foot five and you ran a four five forty in high school, which is like NFL combine <laughs> great time, you know, and you're doing this as a high school senior. When did you realize that 
hey, maybe there's a, a you know more steps to this football yeah. thing than just high school. Did you have a, a, a first sense of when that, wow, I could really potentially play in college? You know, for me, that, that thought kind of came in as a junior. After my junior football season, I went to some college camps. I started to have conversations with coaches and I looked around and realized like, hey, the guys that are going off to play college sports, I feel like I can compete with those guys. And in some cases, I'm, I'm better than them. So that's where I started to develop the confidence and started to think about my football career going beyond just just high school. It's really interesting. I think sometimes people have this burning desire from a young age. And then in other cases, it's it's more like, whoa, this could actually be a possibility for me. And yeah. it's the possibility that wakes someone up and yeah. then the drive kind of follows. It sounds more like you were in that ladder camp. Yeah, no, that that's a great description of kind of how the process went for me. I always approached sports with the idea of really trying to be the best that I could in that moment. And it's like, you know, I'm a junior in high school and I want to be the best receiver I can to help my team, to show that I'm worthy of, you know, getting the ball thrown my way. Just those kind of simple things you think about as a 14, 15 year old athlete. And it, it just snowballed. I mean, even as I eventually went on to college, that was the same thing. You know, how can I be the best where I am today. And then you look up one day and you realize, hey, you know, I can take this thing to the next level. You went to Miami, Ohio, played wide receiver, and you had a notable quarterback that you were paired up with there. Tell me about your, your college days and what you learned from playing college football. Playing alongside, as you mentioned, Ben Roethlisberger, just an awesome quarterback, awesome leader. We had some great years. He helped to recruit me actually to Miami. I remember as a high schooler uh, showing up for my official visit and he helped to show me around and he pulled me aside and he said, hey, look, you know, one day I want to I want to be in the Heisman Trophy discussion. And the only way for me to do that is get surrounded by great teammates and have great receivers. And this was his kind of sales pitch to me to say, hey, come on board. And, you know, he said it with a conviction and a belief that really resonated with me. So for, you know, several other reasons, but ultimately I, I signed up and we had a, a great time there, a great career at Miami. What's that relationship like between a QB and a wide receiver? <laughs> when you guys sync up and really appreciate one another's skills and what you both bring to the table, I think that's when you know, people would say the magic starts to happen, you know, and for Ben and I, we had that in college. It was great mutual respect and I knew how great he was and, and what he brought to the table. And I think he he felt the same way about me. So we developed this kind of really almost sign language and body language. We could read one another from across the field and um, we were almost like two plays ahead. Have you been able to take that dynamic of sort of being so in sync with someone and, you know, almost an unspoken language and both being two steps ahead. Has that showed up at all elsewhere in your life now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I'm obligated to say that my wife and I have, uh, you know, have a chemistry that that uh, is kind of in that space. But truthfully, Sports offers an opportunity to do that in a way that few other things do. And, you know, I don't think that I've ever had that type of chemistry with someone else within sports, because when you're having success and you're both kind of growing and developing and getting better every day, it's just really cool to see it come together. And he, he I'm sure, has that today with Antonio Brown, but it's just cool to see how he's developed and taken what we had on to the, the next level. And you and Ben Roethlisberger team back up in the NFL. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you were on the Steelers together? Yeah, it was, it was really cool. I mean, I remember showing up on day one and just us kind of embracing one another and acknowledging that, you know, we were happy to be back together. Um, it was fun for me to see the development that he had had had. And at that point, he'd already won a Super Bowl. One thing coaches like to say is stay ready. Yeah. What does that phrase mean to you? Yeah, when, when you say it, I, I think of kind of how I would have interpreted that in college. 
versus the NFL. And in college, the idea of stay ready is, hey, you never know, like the guy ahead of you could wind up with an injury or we might decide, hey, it's your turn. Like we're going to we're going to toss you in there. So be ready. But in the NFL, there's so much business and politics involved. You kind of take it with a grain of salt because in some situations you feel like, hey, I'm ready. I've proven I deserve this opportunity. But because of contracts or because of politics, you don't get that opportunity. But when I was in Pittsburgh throughout the season, I'd kind of established myself as like the next man up, the receiver that could make plays, could play any position, you know, any any wide out spot on the field and was that stay ready guy, if you will. And the AFC championship game, we'd played a really physical cook game and actually Heinz Ward, uh, you know, what will be, I'd imagine a future, you know, a Hall of Fame receiver. He'd gotten banged up in the AFC championship game. And so here we are two weeks out from the Super Bowl and our starting wide receiver was down with an injury. And Coach Tomlin called me into his office and he said, hey, you're going to play. You're going to play in the Super Bowl. We need you to be ready and go through these next two weeks with the starting group because this is your this is your opportunity. So now you're thinking that whole grain of salt thing's out the window. <laughs> like, I'm in. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, I, I, I'd say, you know, here I was, waited all year on the biggest stage, biggest game, it sounds like my moment is is coming. So I was excited. I was, I just jumped into the opportunity with the mindset that, you know, I'm prepared and I'm ready. So game day, you wake up. Right. What happens? Kind of wake up with those butterflies and you're, uh, you know, you're trying to keep your game face on, you're trying to dial in and, and focus in for the game. And um, and ultimately, I get to the stadium, I get to my locker, and there's no equipment there. Mm. And so that was kind of my signal, um, kind of the cue to say, hey, the, the team decided not to actually pull the trigger at the at kind of the, the final end. And um, Hines, you know, as I look back, it, it shouldn't have been much of a surprise, but I think his mindset was, you know, there's nothing that's going to keep me from from playing in this game. And so I remember the offensive coordinator Bruce Arians pulled me aside where as we're warming up, we got just the buzz of of the Super Bowl. And he kind of pulls me over and he says, hey, I just want you to know that you did everything you needed to prepare. And we had the utmost confidence that you were ready and were ready to put you in there. It was good to hear that, you know, that plug of confidence from from the offensive coordinator. What was that like for you showing up to yeah. the locker? No equipment. It was tough. It was, uh, you know, one of those hard pills to swallow, one of those moments where you feel like you're so close to this huge moment and who, who knows where that moment takes you. So it was it was really difficult in that moment. But at the same time, here I was at a Super Bowl on part of this team that was was getting ready to compete for a world championship. So, you know, I tried to kind of push my kind of selfish feelings aside and think bigger than that and appreciate the moment as best I could, even though, you know, I had went through what was kind of a, a tough situation. How has that tough pill to swallow served you in your life beyond football? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it really has helped me to uh, just have perspective, not judge every book by its cover. You kind of think about situations that on the surface, they might look really good or on the surface, they might really um, look difficult or bad. But sometimes there are stories underneath there that you don't you don't realize or appreciate. And so it's funny, people here, you know, I played I was a part of this Super Bowl team and I have a Super Bowl ring. And, you know, of course, in their mind, they're like, this is the magical experience that, um, you know, it can't get any better than that. But I do have kind of a tough story that's threaded in there, kind of sits beneath the surface that was hard. But but now, you know, having been, you know, years removed and, um, you know, I've, I've gained perspective. Um, it was just my story, you know, just the awesome, awesome story as I look at it holistically that I really wouldn't change. It was it's something that's unique to me that I think has has shaped me. In, in a way that I really appreciate. 
a character building moment for you that you now build on in the rest of your life. And as disappointing as I can imagine that moment was from a personal standpoint, you still earn the Super Bowl ring. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to help a team, which you did in preparation, in practice, not just before that one game, but but all year long. And so you deservingly earned your Super Bowl ring. So you got the character building moment and you got the ring yeah. uh, to yeah. move forward with. Right, right. Clearly you were a star in college and you put up big numbers and that's what allowed you to move to the next level of being in the NFL and playing four seasons. But you were oftentimes on a practice squad and playing a different role than being a star. What was that experience like for you? You know, I think that experience was, um, it was humbling, but at the same time, I never really embraced kind of that star <laughs> mentality or really saw myself as like this superstar. I, I loved to I was always challenging myself to see how good can I be and, you know, how much better can I get? And so going to the NFL and kind of taking a step back in terms of my status on the team. And, you know, here I was a captain joining a team and being kind of the the low, low man on the totem pole. It kind of forced me to test how I identified myself and where I found my value. And it forced me to think about what being a popular player or a star meant to me and and force kind of a reality check to to say hey like think about where you fit into this whole thing not just in football but in life and the more i worked through that and and got the got to the right place i think the the better the experience became for me it sounds like a great self inquiry in thinking about that what did you learn about yourself in, in asking some of those really good questions. Yeah, I mean, I think that pushed me to really value some of my deepest relationships, my friends, my family, the people that were with me through thick, through thin, through the ups, the downs. Like, I just grew a greater appreciation for those people because I realized that it wasn't about how many touchdowns I'd caught or how much money they thought that, you know, I might make one day, those types of things, you know, the people in my kind of circle or in, you know, who were close to me were just so loyal, so authentic, so true. That was something that I really cherished and embraced. And I think grew a greater appreciation for as my career took, took different turns. How did you approach just showing up every day, not having a guarantee of sort of the bright light shining on you. Yeah, I mean, I would say there there are two things that come to mind with with that question and and perspective. For me, I always wanted to prove to myself, to the people around me, that you know I was the best player on the field. It was just a competitive drive that pushed me to go to work every day and compete. At every level, I wanted to find out how good can I be. And so I would push, I would work, I would do all the extra things to try to see just how far can I push this thing? Like, what can I create in myself and kind of use my body and mind to like develop this receiver that, you know, as good as he, he could possibly be? Like, that was how I approached it. And I think those were the things that motivated me most to just continue to work and work regardless of the outcome. There's a million high school football players. Wow. Think okay. about that. Yeah. And 20,000 NCAA freshman football players down to 300 rookies in the NFL. Wow. So if you go from the million in high school yep. down to the NFL, that's 0.08%. So wow. eight wow. people out of every 10,000 or even in the league. Yeah. So it's really, you know, odds defying stuff. When you hear those numbers, you've just kind of defied the odds at so many points in your athletic career that you kind of form this mentality that, hey, you know, the odds don't apply to me. And yeah, I hear that, you know, only a few will make it, but I'm going to be that one. You know, a lot of it is hard work. A lot of it is skill and talent, but there's definitely a component of luck and being in the right place at the right time and having the right teammates and the coaches around you. So I think it gives me a level of humility as well, because so many people have to 
land in your lap and kind of help you along the way to get to some of those places. One of my favorite movies that happens to be a sports movie is Field of Dreams. Okay. You know, there's a character in that movie, Doc Moonlight Graham. Okay. You know, the okay. mythology is he's on the cusp of making it to the majors. And then he plays in one game. That was his mo one moment under yeah. the lights. Okay. And you share a unique yes, distinction yes, in right. that you were in the NFL for four years. Yep. And similarly, you had one game where you were, you know, on the field putting up stats. So do you remember that game? Yeah, kind of a cool story. I played obviously in a bunch of preseason games throughout the course of my career, but this was the one time that I'd been called up to the 53 man roster and had a chance to play during a regular season game. It was actually uh, while I was playing with the Vikings, we had a home game against the St. Louis Rams, which, you know, your hometown team. Right, right, oh, right. Cool. Which uh, unfortunately is in LA now, but at the time, you're right, they were my hometown team. So it was awesome. I got a chance to suit up against my hometown team, tell all my friends and family, hey, tune in. This one, you know, you're going to you're gonna get to catch me out there. And uh, I ended up starting in that game. What do you remember most? Really just the, the speed uh, of the game, you know, you play the game for so many years and you you get a chance, like I mentioned, to play in preseason, but the intensity of a regular season game kicks up even another notch. I remember just getting a chance to catch a handful of balls throughout the day, playing alongside people like Adrian Peterson and, you know, really great players. So had an awesome experience and, uh, you know, just enjoyed the the competition and being able to say that, hey, I, I play, played on the, the biggest stage in front of front of the people that, you know, that I kind of love and care about the most. So when did you decide that it was enough? How did you come to the decision that you were going to move on from football? Yeah, it's funny. As I look back at it, I think the Super Bowl was um, kind of a turning point for me. You know, I checked a box that so few people get to check in in sports. And so now what? Like now what is next? It actually pushed my mind to start to think about other things outside of football. Those thoughts about, hey, maybe I ought to do something else or maybe it's time rattle around for a while before it first you know, comes out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. How did it feel saying it out loud for the first time? It was a gradual process for me. I think I kind of poked around at the idea and started to form a picture in my mind and discuss it with my wife about, hey, if I decided to go do something else, like what would that look like? What would the transition be? What kind of motivations would I find? And, and in doing that, I think it started to just take shape and the picture became more and more real the more time I spent thinking about it. What did you discover in thinking about it? That I was really excited about other things and developing my career beyond football and the potential that existed outside of, of uh, playing in the NFL. What was the, like the first little mini step that yeah. you took or, you know, what did you put into action? So actually, I participated in a off-season program that the NFL offered. It was an executive education program at Harvard, at Harvard's business school. We went out to Cambridge and studied and did case studies and really had what would I, what I describe now as a mini MBA experience. You know, it was a chance to like get exposed to the professors there and to even some of the current students, the MBA students that were in the HBS program at the time. So it just opened my eyes and I think planted a seed that, hey, this could be an awesome way to to make the transition. And from there, I couldn't stop thinking about opportunities outside of football. Even as I was in practice, my mind was there. And I think that's when I kind of knew like, all right, this is real. Like your, <laughs> your head is, is elsewhere. And uh, what was the first thing after you had that taste of the program mm -hmm. at Harvard? What did you sink your teeth into next? So then I started to think about all the endless opportunities that exist within a, a business career, whether it was real estate investment or starting my own company as an entrepreneur or marketing or investment banking. Like I just started to kind of 
go and investigate all these different paths and talk to people and even shadow some of the professionals that were within within Pittsburgh at the time. I'd go and spend a day with a president of a hospital or... How did you make that happen for yourself? That's I love that. That's an amazing move. How did you make that happen? Yeah, I mean, that was uh, that was one of the perks of being a stealer in, in, in Pittsburgh. You know, if you ask somebody to, to hang out or go to dinner or sit down for coffee, like rarely did you get people that would turn you down. Uh, so I, I use that to my advantage to meet people, to form relationships that allowed me to, to better understand what opportunities and careers were out there. So it was great. I, I got access to people that I, I think I would have never had a chance to access you know, had I not been part of the, the Steelers organization. How did you first start to think about business school? I kind of went back to where I was most comfortable. I went back to, to campus at Miami and I met with a bunch of professors and and at the time, they'd formed a one-year MBA program at Miami. And so I would went through the process of applying and got accepted into the program. And I remember my oldest sister, Melanie, she's, she's actually a surgeon. She said, hey, I know Miami's a great school. You, you love it there. But would you consider kind of pushing yourself into some of the bigger programs or some of the more competitive programs? That was a little uncomfortable because here I had this nice, comfortable path back to a place that I was familiar with and had it all kind of laid out for me. I pushed myself to go apply to some of the top ranked programs in the country. And in doing that, I landed at Michigan and had a great experience there. And that was really just a credit to her, my sister and, and my wife, both kind of teaming up to push me to think bigger and broader than than where I'd been in the past. Did you miss football at that point while you're in business school? No, I didn't. Did that surprise you? You know, your whole life been an NFL yeah. player, big part of your identity, you know, mm -hmm. how you see yourself in the mirror. Now it's gone and you say you didn't miss it. Was that surprising? It was. I expected to like yearn to be back on the field and uh, have this kind of hole <laughs> in me uh, because I wasn't playing. But in fact, um, I had a chance to travel the world. I had a chance to meet just amazing classmates and professors and be challenged in ways that I'd never been challenged before. And so I had this really stimulating experience that I think again, just uh, helped me to avoid the negative feelings of missing the game that, that I really en loved and enjoyed for so many years. Some players have a really difficult time with transition and with letting go and with moving forward. Do you have any instincts as to why it's so difficult for, for some players to move on? Yeah, I think it, it's in many instances, it's having an identity that's based upon the game and 90% of the people that know you, they know you because you are the football player or you are in the NFL. It can be very difficult to kind of give that title up. I think a lot of people just get so, in some cases, addicted to that identity and being kind of respected or appreciated as the NFL player, it can be really challenging to give give that up. Yeah, the job at hand is really reinvention in a sense. It's how do I take who I've become and then leverage that for whatever's next. So yeah. it sounds like you really found your next thing as as business school and that was what you could latch on to. You know, I always had a great appreciation for kind of authenticity and authentic relationships. And and so transitioning out of the NFL actually gave me more access to that. I can be kind of a regular person. And w as I look back on my time at Michigan, that was a, one of the things that was so much fun for me is being able to tailgate, being able to just go to the stadium and kind of cheer for the team and like be a fan and be a student and not a student athlete, but just a student, like focus on my academics and let that be kind of the highest of priorities for me. I enjoyed that experience and I wouldn't have been able to do that had I just remained in kind of this 
NFL identity. So how did you first get your foot in the door at Gatorade? At Michigan, um, we had access to a bunch of different companies that were coming to campus to recruit. And I was fortunate enough to get an internship opportunity at Gatorade during my MBA uh, process, kind of the summer between my first year and second year. And I came out to Chicago and had an awesome summer. I mean, Chicago summer will sell most people. So I really enjoyed it and, and uh, enjoyed the people there and was fortunate enough to to get invited to come back full time. Could you ever have imagined that you would have appeared in a Gatorade ad? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean even even today that <laughs> that doesn't quite sound right, but explain how that came to be. Yeah, yeah, really cool story there. I mean, I'd been working working on Gatorade leading uh, a bunch of kind of campaign development and advertising work and we had this fast and furious project to develop a TV campaign around our 50th anniversary as, as the Gatorade brand. I'd done a ton of work on the project and got it really right to the finish line. And I had a great boss in, in Molly Carter who, who kind of went behind the scenes and as, as uh, I guess, just a nod to me and a, a way to express her appreciation. She had our creative agency splice in some of my, my footage into the the ad and they kind of surprised me in a meeting showed me the tv commercial with me actually in it which was now this was awesome. the spot started with one and it would show someone like wearing jersey number one and then yep. two and, and and so on and so on and you know you are number 15 yeah in the nfl so that was you who appeared at, at 15 when they showed you the first version of it yeah yeah exactly i mean guys like Derek jeter at number two and D Wade at number three, and of course, MJ at 23 and, you know, examples like that throughout the spot. And here we are at 15 and, and I, I pop up. So for me, it, it, uh, it was awesome. Just, uh, you know, something that I always remember and appreciate just a really cool kind of backstory for me with respect to the Gatorade brand. That's really cool. Now they ran that, I understand, once on yep. television. Yeah, that's right. And then they replaced it with some other 15. Who was yep. the other 15? Who who beat you out <laughs> the, in the end? Who? No, I think it was, uh, if I remember correctly, I think it was the University of Alabama. So they have, I think it's 15 national championships. And so, uh, yeah, they ended up plugging the the you know, the Crimson Tide in, in place of, of little old Martin Nance. <laughs> I guess there's always a, a bigger, you know, king That's of right. the hill when you turn right. around a corner, right? You're 15. I guess there are 15 national yeah, titles yeah. beat out your jersey yeah, number. Yeah, I'm willing to take a step back. I mean, I was in the debut, so I feel like, <laughs> you know, the spot is really mine, but I'll step, <laughs> I'll step aside and let them have it from here. Fair enough. Very gracious of you. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> So uh, what other um, memorable TV campaigns have you been a part of? I mean, Gatorade has some of the most iconic ads of all time. So some of the, the ones that I've worked on that really stood out, we did some work for Jeter's retirement, which was really cool. I was a part of that team. And we do some really cool product work as well, just highlighting, you know, how our product fuels people like Serena Williams and you know, obviously we're always leaning into MJ and leveraging his greatness. So I've had a chance to work with Usain Bolt, one of my favorite athletes. And, you know, like I mentioned, Serena, JJ Watt. So it's it's been a fun ride for sure. It's amazing. So you're the director of marketing and athlete activation at Gatorade, $6 billion company. What does that role entail? And it pulls together a few different teams that all kind of operated in their own worlds previously. It's uh, it's a great challenge, a great team of people. I have our largest sporting goods customers throughout the country. That channel of business sits uh, within my team, as well as this large network of athletic team dealers. So these are folks and, you know, they sell our equipment and our products into high schools and gyms throughout the entire country. The other big team that sits uh, within my group is a field sales and marketing team. So these are folks that they sell into and develop, maintain relationships with high schools, with um, athletic trainers, coaches, things like that. So these are boots on the ground salespeople who have different territories and it's their job to 
make sure that Gatorade continues to show up in right. you know, on sidelines and yeah. in places where sport lives, which is, you know, I think been one of the strengths of the Gatorade brand that it, it shows up. It's everywhere, right? It Absolutely. almost feels like it's part of the fabric of sport itself. And so it's your job to make sure that that continues and expands. How many of these on the ground salespeople are part of your team that you're managing now? Yeah, so all 40 of them roll into the team that I'm managing. We have four different regional managers that help to kind of oversee their respective territories. So and then the the four managers report into me. So it's good. It, it allows me to kind of take a step back and really focus on strategically how we want the team to move and operate and evolve. So, you know, that's kind of one side of the team and then a handful of people that work on Again, the sporting goods, sporting sports specialty kind of athletic team dealer relationships as well. So it's a big team, close to 50, but again, really good people in place. And, you know, I'm learning a lot from them for sure. It's a huge team. It's actually, that's pretty similar in size to a, you know, active player roster in the (laughs) NFL. That's right. And so in some senses, you know, you said you have a few good managers under you. It's almost as if you're the head coach and you've got you know, offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, they have teams beneath them and players on the field beneath them. What did you learn from, uh, you know, your career as an athlete that you're now can bring into this newfound sort of head coach position? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, 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 I guess a nice way to, to think about it in terms of how we're structured. One of the things that I would say I've learned is just this idea of balance and motivating your team in the way that is right for for them, you know, kind of being the coach that they need. There's a part of you that wants to be kind of the Bill Belichick to make sure everything is meticulously planned out and orchestrated and executed the way that, that you envision it, kind of dictate down to the team exactly what the expectation is and, and what you need from them. But then you also want to balance it with kind of that player coach mentality where, you know, the the team really embraces you and you have these close relationships and deep relationships with your team so that people enjoy being a part of the team and enjoy kind of working with you and, and following your lead. And uh, I've had some great coaches along the way. Coach Tomlin is a great example of someone who could balance both of those and have the maintain kind of the the respect and position that he he that's warranted in a head coach but also be relatable be approachable be someone that your your team enjoys being around and uh, that's the balance that I try to strike you know I definitely have a vision and and am motivated to ensure that the team reaches the goals that we set out for ourselves but at the same time, I think it's a, a great group of people that we enjoy being around each other. We have fun. We make sure that people are getting the development and experiences they need. Try to try to make it all work together. It's great. It sounds like you're really modeling a lot of the kind of managerial behavior you saw from coaches, which is what I think is an amazing advantage that athletes have is that all coming up, we were able to experience what it's like to be managed in a sense, what coaches are, they're teachers, but also managers, Mm -hmm. all these different styles and you can compare and contrast. It's a, it's a pretty great classroom for life and gives you, I think for me, it's given me a sense of how to manage teams and lead. And I find myself going back into sports and thinking about what that great leader do and how can I be a little more like them? Yeah, no, that's that's exactly it. And I kind of have a little notebook that I try to go back to, to, to say, what were those things that I said, you know what, as a boss, I will never do that. Or like, I hope that I never become that person, you know, so I try to kind of keep myself in check and hold myself accountable to some of those things. Because as a leader, things move fast, and you look up and you know, you're leading a a, a sizable team, or you're in situations that maybe managers before you had, had been in, and you want to, you want to build on those things versus start from scratch yourself and and kind of take all the lumps that the people ahead of you have already navigated through. I love that idea of, of keeping the notebook with these 
lessons learned. When did that start for you? Probably back when I played uh, played in the NFL. So I would sit and, and listen to coaches and take notes and I would jot down things like that. You know, if I ever become a coach or even as a leader, a captain, you know, these are some things that never, never do this, never say this, never start your meeting. This. Do you remember some of the nevers? Yeah, yeah. Actually, one that stood out to me was um, I'd had I had a head coach who proceeds to spend the next hour and a half talking about the do's and don'ts of social media and some of the content that he'd had his team go in and find on different players, social media websites. I just remember thinking like, if you're going to kick off a season, if you're going to charter your team or the charter this big project, like make sure you focus on the things that are most important and most critical and the things you want them to take away, not these side distractions or even, you know, things that might have some importance, but aren't core to what you're trying to accomplish. Like just make sure you, you zero in on the right things at the right times. It's a, right. it's a valuable lesson. Setting the tone often happens very early in the first things a leader says to their group. And so focusing on vision and goals and all that to begin. And then over time, you can talk about some don't do's, but keeping people um, moving toward something yes, versus yes. trying to not do something like working in the positive and, you know, going towards is so much more effective than avoiding or the going against I have a belief that athletes have worked their whole lives and they have actually shaped the chemical makeup of their brain, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. from a neuroplasticity standpoint, doing something over and over can create new neural connections mm -hmm. and actually change the makeup of the brain. So I call it a athletic mind. Yeah. You know, it's an yeah. asset that over years and years of athletic experiences, like the brain is ours to yep. use and leverage as we move forward. And it's deeper than a mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I think a mindset is something that anyone can kind of try on, Embrace, you know, like yeah. putting on a new shirt and you wear it for a while and maybe it sticks and maybe it doesn't. Right. But some of these things, as you've mentioned, defying the odds, that's not something that you're imagining that's not something that you're putting on that's grooved in your brain and is like an asset for you moving forward yeah no i i definitely embrace that i think that having those really endless examples of overcoming adversity and dealing with challenges and kind of the optimism that you have to have as an athlete i think is something that is so hard to just embrace or so hard to just step into if you don't have kind of a lifetime of examples of that that you've gone through and accomplished and those changes that happen in your brain are very real for me you know i definitely embrace that as as truth it's great the mental side of uh, of sports and athleticism is something i would say I take the most pride in, you know, it's one thing to be physically gifted, but I just feel like me, even as a kid, I always felt like mentally I was the best, you know, there weren't other. People. What was that? What, what, what more specific, yeah. like what aspect of that mental ability do you think you had? Uh, I just felt like I always had the, the right type of optimism and the right belief in myself and the right level of resiliency and fortitude. And um, mentally, I just felt like where other people might get weak or, you know, show cracks in their armor, like I was going to persevere and, and come out on top, even able to being able to recover from a loss. You know, I just felt like I could do those things better than the people around me. And that comes from my dad. I, uh, remember those rides home after a game, whether it be a win, whether it be a loss, and just getting that chance to process it with him and hear how he encouraged me to think about my competition and the game and my, the people that I was going to have to compete against. That's where I developed that, and that has always stuck with me. So even as I, I kind of navigate my career, I always feel confident that regardless of the situation, you know, mentally, I will approach it in a healthy way and 
in a way that kind of sets me up to come out in a good place, you know, and, and you know, hopefully that doesn't come off as arrogant because I acknowledge, I, I understand everyone can kind of operate at their, the right kind of mental state that, that fits them. But um, I just feel really good about mine and the things that my father has instilled in me with respect to that. It's beautiful. And that athletic mind is now yours. That's your asset that you have to really fuel you through, you know, any new chapter that you might have um, to wrap things up. And this has been an amazing conversation. What advice would you give to your freshman year college version of Martin? I think if I had to tell my freshman year self some advice, I would say just soak it up, cherish it. Don't get so caught up in uh, where you're trying to go that you don't appreciate, remember, and take in every step along the way. I think I was pretty driven, pretty focused as a uh, college athlete. But because of that, I didn't always cherish and soak up some of the smaller details and some of the things that I think uh, are most uh, appreciated or valued. That's good. It's a really good, uh, really good reminder. Thanks so much for sitting down and sharing your story and your perspective. And I learned a lot and um, you feel like a teammate. Yeah, no, it's, it's, great. Uh, it, it's uh, my pleasure. I just appreciate you having me, having me on uh, just even, you know, the questions and conversation that uh, you, you always stimulate me with when we connect is, uh, is valuable. And I just have a lot of respect for, for you and, and kind of your perspective. So again, thanks again for, for having me on and, uh, anytime I'd love to, to come back and continue part two. It's my pleasure and my honor. Thanks again. Awesome. Thanks, Martin. Give the big jump a holler on Instagram or Twitter at big jump show on the podcast chart. Season one netted a perfect five-star rating for the big jump. And if you're so inclined, I would be grateful if you could show some love by throwing us five stars. And if this is your first episode, don't forget to subscribe. And show notes, get your show notes here. If you're listening while driving or are sharpening knives underwater, show notes for this episode and links to everything mentioned can be found at thebigjumpshow.com. When I need a change of pace from podcasts, I love listening to audiobooks on Audible. So I partnered up with Audible to give new customers a free audiobook. They're an Amazon company, so everything just works, and they've got over 180,000 titles to choose from. Just go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook to get your free audiobook, simply for creating a free account. Again, to start off your Audible account with a free audiobook, go to thebigjumpshow.com slash audiobook. Happy listening. And lastly, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Grand Voyage, a luxury fashion brand and a personal favorite of mine that makes shoes and bags designed in LA and handcrafted in Italy at the same factories as other premier fashion labels, but at a much better value. GQ says they're, quote, changing the fashion game. And Grand Voyage is perfect if you're trying to change up your fashion game. And by change up, I do mean upgrade. Use the promo code THEBIGJUMP for $35 off the beautiful bags and shoes from Grand Voyage. Yes, $35 off. Go check them out. See what I mean by going to thebigjumpshow.com slash shoes. And from there, as they say, the rest is up to you.